Hey, it's showtime. Welcome to Chill Skills Sporland Tech Talks. The topic for this episode is high pressure oil level control systems. This is a continuation of a series of presentation that has been following the agenda of the old supermarket seminar series. You know, in the past, Sporland had a team of professionals on a supermarket team that went all around the country to facilitate these presentations in person. What a novel idea that was. With this tech talk entry, boy, say tech talk three times real fast. We are bringing the supermarket seminar concept directly to you and hopefully servicing a bigger audience in the process. Here's a shameless promotion for the next webinar. On March 18th, we will present defrost types. We'll cover things like electric, gas, and off time. Everything you wanted to know about defrost methods and maybe some things you didn't. This thing over here, though, kind of looks like an ice maker, doesn't it? I don't think it's supposed to quite be that. Not quite like that, no. no. You know, March 18th is coming up pretty quick. Put it on your calendar. Once we get to April, we're going to go back to one of these per month. Mm -hmm. Here are a few instructions. If the speaker on your computer doesn't work, you ought to go down to Best Buy before they close it and get a new one. Or you can simply dial in with your phone. There should be a phone number somewhere on the invitation that you originally received for the webinar. Uh, but here it is on the slide, and we got it handy here. But if you're seeing the slide, I don't know that you need it. Kind of makes sense, Probably doesn't not. it? Makes sense. As we move along and you have questions, you can type those questions into the Q&A window. We plan to answer some questions live. If we run out of time, we'll go circle back around and we'll post uh, answers to your questions online. However, if you hang on, there's a good bet that we may answer your question during the course of the webinar itself. And just so you know, we get asked this all the time. Yes, we are recording this and we'll post it out on Facebook Live to begin. And then we'll circle back around, as I've said before, and put it on YouTube. And you can always go to the Sporland YouTube channel or to www.sporland.com to review this webinar later or any of the past ones that we've done. Sporland is always here to assist you with the air conditioning and refrigeration flow control needs. You can reach us by calling the general number for Sporland HQ. That's 636-239-1111. You can also get a hold of us directly at tech support and that's tech support for like those air conditioning and refrigeration flow control tech problems that you encounter. You can call us at 636-392-3906 or you can fire off an email to SVD tech support at parker.com. We're always there 24 seven to help you as well online. Hello, I'm Jim Jansen, senior application engineer for the Sportland application team. And this good looking guy right here is me. Yeah, right. And joining, you know, I keep forgetting John that we're broadcasting a video. We are. Yeah. We are. And so yeah. there you are and there you are. Isn't here, that crazy? Here I am over here. John is our senior principal engineer for the Sporland division. He's a published author, consultant, and I keep saying it, he's an all around extra smart guy. I used to call on him when he worked at Hussman and I was out in the field when they let me talk to customers directly. And they don't want me doing that anymore, obviously. Yeah. You know. mm, yeah. uh, and John still talks to me even to this day. I do. John's a big deal around here. We're always happy to have him with us. And Phyllis is in the room. She's our communications director. She tells us what to do and when to do it. And occasionally we pay attention to her. Most of the time we don't though, right? Well, yeah. sometimes. Now, this is a little bit of a review. Last time we covered low pressure oil control systems. And remember, www.sporland.com and you can watch that previous webinar because we recorded it. And you can listen to all and watch all the rest of them as well. John, what should be circulating around the vapor compression refrigeration system? We discussed this last time. Oh, What's the I, answer? I know that one. Go. Re what is it? Refrigerant. That's a good answer. Mm -hmm. How about some lubricant? Should we have any of that? Yeah, probably so. That's, prob that's a good idea to have a little bit of that too. Why do we need it? Well, compressors don't really like to run without any kind of lubricant. Okay. And anything else might just be a contaminant. Along the way, some of that oil gets pumped out into the system, goes, gets out into the piping and the components. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a problem. We're going to talk about that. In a simple form, an oil separator alone could serve as the oil management system. If you had a small conventional system, a 
system with one compressor and one evaporator, that might work just fine, like on a residential AC unit. Definitely. And that might not even have a separator at all, right? That might rely more just on system design for proper, proper oil control and proper oil return. But if you've got a large, complicated, multiplex supermarket system like <clears throat> is shown here, some type of oil management system is almost always required to corral the oil and get it back to the compressor. Mm -hmm. And here we're showing that low pressure system that we discussed last time. To keep things in balance, the oil leaving with the refrigerant discharge vapor, where we, right here, oil leaving with discharge vapor needs to equal the oil returning from the suction vapor. Where is that? Right, right there, John, is right that there. oil return? And plus the oil that we're pulling from the reserve or the reservoir, if the you reservoir. will. Mm -hmm. Now we haven't talked much about oil reservoirs yet, but we will. If this oil gets out into the system and it's going to, what can be done to get it back to the compressor? That's called oil return and there can be issues with that process. Here are some things on the slide that contribute to poor oil return once it's made it out into the system. Let's take a look at this. So we have low load conditions which lead to lower refrigerant velocities. Then there's also improper traps and piping errors. Yeah. Those piping design has a lot to do with proper oil return. Mm -hmm. And low charge and compressor short cycle. Yeah. Either, All, either one of those can cause, can cause similar problems. And that's the answer why, why maybe you don't get that lubricant back to the compressor mm -hmm. where it needs to be. Correct. Now, We've discussed why the system needs oil. We've discussed the compressor's need for the lubricant. Uh, it lubricates the compressor. And also we take advantage of the fact that it moves some of the other, other parts in the system, but primarily for that compressor. Primarily for the compressor. Now, how do we manage the oil and get it back to the rack so it can lubricate the compressor? Well, in this slide, we are examining very quickly the low pressure oil management system. We discussed this last time. You can go back and look at it again because we recorded it, www.sporland.com. And you can look at all the past webinars as well. Remember the low pressure oil system has a separate oil separator. You like that separate oil separator? It's catchy. And, and an oil reservoir. And this shows the high pressure line that's feeding the reservoir, and then we got the oil differential check valve, which drops the pressure down so that we don't pop these oil level controls wide open. Discharge gas leaves the compressor and oil is removed in the separator and the process goes on. That's right. Now, here's the high pressure oil system. <clears throat> high pressure oil systems have a combination oil separator and reservoir like you see right here. That's a significant difference from the low pressure oil system design. John, might this result in a little potential cost savings, at least initially? It could be. Fewer components uh, overall uh, might lead to a slightly lower upfront cost. The oil in the reservoir, of course, is at discharge pressure. I guess this line right here is what's feeding it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oil at discharge pressure leaves the separator reservoir when there's a need. And it looks like it comes through this, what, oil filter? Is that an oil filter right there? That's an oil filter. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then it goes to this Y1236-C. I guess that oil pressure is at pretty high pressure and it's gotta be reduced a certain amount. It does. In order to introduce it to the oil level control. And the Y1236-C accomplishes the required pressure drop. Mm -hmm. For anybody that doesn't know, Sporlin over the years has used a numbering sequence, a Y is in yellow with a number following it to identify OEM specials that we made. So this is the 1,236 OEM special that we've made. It just happens that we also sell this through authorized wholesalers as well. Now let's talk a little bit more about that. Oh, look at there, we've highlighted, we've actually got two of them. There's one right here to feed the compressors that would be on the rack. And we've also got one over here feeding this satellite compressor. That's pretty neat. Oh, and there was a reminder for me to mention oil filters. That's why that 
that neat little animation is there. Mm -hmm. And you forgot about that, didn't you, John? You know, I did. I, yeah, I'm you sorry. did. You did. I apologize. Two different oil differential valves are available. The Y825-2 that you see over here. And then, of course, the newer Y1236-C. The Y825-2, the dash two just means it's the second in the sequence that was made, you know, as far as it's an OEM special that we made for Hussman's high pressure oil system years ago. The Y1236 over here, like I said, is an aftermarket alternative available through the wholesale network. The products look quite a bit different and they are quite different internally. However, function, adjustment range and factory setting are the same. That's a neat idea. Our Pat Bundy conceptualized this Y1236 over here for just this very application. Pat's had a bunch of different positions with us here at Sporland, including being a member of that former supermarket team. And he's currently a tech support team uh, member assisting customers every day. He's got an article that's getting ready to be published on out on the RSCS journal on refrigeration basics. That's what we that's, understand. It's yes. coming out pretty soon. You ought to be sure and check that out when it happens. Here's the factory setting for both valves and the adjustment range in both instances, 10 to 25 PSI differential and a 17 PSI factory setting. The Y1236 will prevent excessive pressure drop across the OL60. That's the oil level control. Again, if you haven't watched the low pressure version, that'll kind of introduce you to that device. From, that'll keep that from overfeeding the compressor. Uh, if you consulted the OL60 chart to determine the oil pressure that must be maintained, you could then subsequently adjust this valve between that, that 10 to 25 PSI differential pressure range. To reduce differential, you'd turn the adjustment counterclockwise, increase the differential, turn it clockwise. clockwise. And it sounds like that works out to be about 2.5 PSI per turn with that standard factory setting of 17 PSI. This is a neat device. It's basically a balanced ported F valve internally with this, this regulator head on it with the Schrader connection on top. And the C means that it has the pin angle and port and stroke of a C ported balanced ported F valve. And as far as I know, that's the only one that we made. Sound right? I believe so. We mentioned oil separators earlier. What's the deal with these oil separators and how do they work? All oil separators work to remove oil from the discharge gas. The impingement type separator is just one example. That's sometimes referred to that as the conventional oil separator. That's what we are showing here. As discharge gas enters the vessel, that's right here, the gas expands to fill the available volume of the separator. The gas velocity decreases and the atomized oil droplets collect on the impingement screen, the surface of that, as it separates from the discharge gas. As oil drops become larger, I guess, and heavier, they eventually fall to the bottom of the separator and fill it up down here. It's acting as a reservoir to a certain degree. An as, intermediate reservoir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As the oil accumulates, it opens this ball float and allows high pressure oil to flow to the oil reservoir. We will discuss a variety of other separators coming right up. And here is one. This is the helical type. Helical separators have an internal design that directs the discharge gas and oil mixture to follow the spiral path of the internal helix. This centrifugal action causes the heavier oil particles to spin to the perimeter of the shell where it is hinges on the screen and falls to the bottom of the separator. The, these centrifugal separators are used to separate debris from a lot of different types of flow streams, not just this. That's this true. is just one application. When enough oil collects here, it'll lift the ball. Where's that ball? I don't see the ball. Allowing the oil to flow to the reservoir. You see a ball in there? I do not. Actually. I don't know. Not I, think, I don't think there's a ball in this one. Who wrote this script anyway? Was that you? Let's, I'm going to uh, blame it on you. Okay, blame while, it on me. while there is a screen on the outside perimeter of the interior, it typically does not plug with debris as opposed to a coalescing style separator. Mm -hmm. There's also maybe a little less pressure drop here. Right. I've heard that a former Hussman engineer, Roland Ayers, invented this, the 
this thing. Is that he is that was fact? he was pretty much responsible for its invention, absolutely. And then subsequently applied it to the Hussman turbo shed design. Correct. And that's something that a lot of yep. you out there might be familiar with. That if you see the if you see the turbo shed name, uh, this is pretty much how it works. That system used the helix helical separator along with the Y825 Sporlin oil differential pressure regulator. It's not necessarily any more efficient. This is just another version of someone's best idea and best way of doing something. Got another one here. This, you've maybe heard us mention coalescing separator. Well, the combination oil separator reservoir uh, does not have a ball float like the low pressure models do. Instead, the oil leaves the reservoir on demand and we mentioned that before. Coalescing filter type separators use a dense element to remove the oil from the discharge gas and over time, excessive contamination could cause a differential pressure across the filter. Mm -hmm. I think that's a possibility. Yep. They can, they can uh, become uh, contaminated. They are actually a very effective filter for debris as well as coalescing the oil. Makes sense. <clears throat> so you do have to uh, pay some attention to them and, uh, and do ele element changes on them from time to time as a part of regular maintenance. Is that, machine. Is that maybe a, uh, part of an issue with the helical version as well? Is there potential for debris to come out in that version? Not uh, so much? Somewhat, but not, I don't think as much. I don't, okay. I don't think as much. These are, the, the coalescing type are typically a, uh, <clears throat> typically provide pretty fine filtration. And so uh, they will catch things that the helical type will not, uh, thus being a Good idea to have one of our oil filters. Oh, now you're jumping ahead here, John. You got away. <laughs> sorry, sorry, you're, sorry. You're, I apologize. But we will get to the heart of the matter of this oil level control. We talked about these <laughs> last time. Just a few highlights here. The OL60 replaces the old OL1 and 2. It's externally adjustable. It's suitable for up to a 90 PSI pressure differential. This is one device that is equipped with an equalizer that if you don't need it, you can cap it unlike a thermostatic expansion valve. Right. And it is equipped with a new flange style that is a seven bolt universal mounting flange. And that helps us connect to a lot of different manufacturers compressors. And I'll show you a better image of this in just a minute. But here on this slide, we see oil level at the sight glass versus the number of turns of adjustment on the device itself. And then we got these differential pressure ranges and Depending on what pressure differential you need and what level you want at the sight glass, you can make a number of adjustments here at the OL60, or if higher levels are required, you can go back to the differential pressure and, and change out the oil check valve on a low pressure version, or you can make adjustments to that differential valve like the Y825 or the 1236 12, on the high pressure version. So there's some options for you. Dennis, that is slide 18. An optional oil equalization connection can be found on some models, like I mentioned, that's right here. And then of course you get a better visual of the seven bolt hole flange. You know, there's one, two, three, that'd be four or five. I don't even have to take my shoes off to count all these. No, you don't. Six, seven right there. See, here's the old three bolt configuration with the bolt holes highlighted. Here's the old four bolt configuration. And this little devil will work for all of them. And then that slick, in some cases, this could potentially eliminate the need for any of those special oil float adapter kits that we've got available. John, what is one of the worst threats to good system performance, if not the number one culprit? I would say it is the number one culprit and it's contamination. Uh, you know, there was a time when the 100 mesh strainer was thought to provide all the protection needed to prevent system breakdowns. The 100 mesh strainer is still essentially a standard screen size that's used on the inlet of TVs and a lot of other system components as well. However, these strainers are designed strictly for protection against large pieces of solder, scale, hammer handles, and lunchboxes. Mm -hmm. They'll catch every lunchbox. I bet it will. Pipe plugs. The image on, the, on this slide illustrates a magnified view of a 100 mesh strainer screen, which has collected some copper oxide produced by simply brazing copper tubing. Look at all this crud over here. The large particles were caught by the screen. The 
But I tell you what. Yep. And I'm sure they have. Now, let's get a feel for that. The image on this slide provides a perspective on particle size. As comparative dimensions are actually illustrated here. In this example, particle size is expressed in terms of microns. John, what's a micron? Well, a micron is one one thousandth of a millimeter. So it's one times 10 to the negative sixth meters. Oh my gosh. You probably didn't even want to know that, did you? I didn't want to know that at all. <laughs> Over here, we got the 100 mesh screen that you saw on the previous slide. And you can see here, a 100 mesh screen is essentially has a 150 micron opening. Wow, so if you've got a particle that's smaller than that, it's gonna just- It can go right on through. Pass when, and here we show some comparisons that, you know, a human hair, I don't know that this guy's actually human, uh, but one hair, follow, you know, strand of hair, 100 microns, 100 microns. Uh, the lower limit of your ability to see things, maybe around 40, mm -hmm. white blood cell, 25, mm -hmm. red blood cells, even smaller. And then here, if you've ever pulled up alongside of somebody in an intersection and your window's up, but the guy next to you is smoking a cigarette and you can still smell it. That's why. That's why. <laughs> 0.3 microns. You know, in view of the comparison shown here, it might appear that a filter designed to remove particles the size of down to three microns might be overkill. Or Maybe. not. Or not. Or not. I guess it all depends on, on the clearances in the compressor and other devices. Mm -hmm. However, in the case of, of an oil filter applied to a refrigeration or air conditioning system, the removal of particles in the range of even down to two and up to 20 microns could be an issue when the nature of the particle is abrasive. Uh, this, this is kind of meaning it would be a good idea to remove particles even down that small. Very small particles of an abrasive nature, such as iron filings, when in sufficient quantities can lead to adverse bearing wear. And how do we know this? Well, let's take a look at this McPherson curve on the next slide. John, who is this McPherson character anyway? Well, uh, this person was involved in a well-known study that compared bearing life to contaminant size. McPherson proved the removal of very small particles from lubricating oil had a very uh, useful and somewhat dramatic effect uh, on the life of bearings. The finer the filtration, the longer the bearing life. Uh, the plot of that data is called the McPherson curve. Wow, that made you sound awfully smart, John. It, it sure did. Yeah, it sure did. Let's just take a look at the chart over here. Over here, there's a, essentially a unitless a scale that I guess uh, is equivalent to bearing life or fatigue life of a device. Mm -hmm. And down here, there's particle size <clears throat> measured in microns. So you get out here to 40 microns, it's indicating that there's a relatively short bearing life if you've got big particles. I guess some of the worst culprits, you get down in here where the particles are in this six to 10 micron range, they can do a lot of damage, mm -hmm. but even some of these smaller ones can as well. But if you filter right. down to three microns, you're doing yourself a lot of, lot of good when it comes to life expectancy on moving parts. I think the way to look at that, since it is a relative scale on that Y axis over yeah, there. Yeah, over here, yeah. Uh, if is you, it related to you in any way? If you, uh, no, not that I'm aware of. Okay. I'm, right. I don't think I'm aware, I don't think I'm related to McPherson. Okay, but, right. uh, but continue but please. If, if you look at, uh, if you look at the uh, effect of uh, 40 micron particles over yep, there on yep, the far yep, right hand yep, yep. side, and if, you able, if you're able to filter all those down and have nothing, no particles in the oil greater than three microns, mm -hmm you go from a two to a 12. So you can actually expect a six time increase in bearing life. That's the way, I think that's the proper way to look at that scale. Are, are you saying larger particles reduce the life of the rotating device like a compressor by plugging up journals and oil passageways and scoring internal surfaces and damaging bearings? Are you saying that? That's exactly what I'm saying. You know, that might also be a good reason why you ought to change oil in your car every once in a damn while. Once you know? in a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Clean refrigerant oil has always been important. However, with the use of HFC refrigerants requiring polyol ester oils, the importance, you know, POE, POE, the importance has become even greater. Unlike mineral and alka benzene, POE has some solvent 
action tendencies involved mm -hmm. with it. I like to call that's it cool. POE solvent, but that's probably being too harsh. <clears throat> POE lubricant has the ability to suspend and recirculate small solid contaminants that might remain from the system installation or even a retrofit. Mm -hmm. Analysis of POE lubricant samples taken from actual systems have shown the oil to suspend and recirculate a high concentration of, here, wait for it, two to 20 micron sized particles, with the largest percentage being between two to 10. Remember that curve? Mm -hmm. Although some particles are smaller than bearing tolerances, studies have shown bearing life can still be affected. Bearing wear depends upon the size, hardness, and concentration of particles in circulation. I bet there's a way to get some of those particles out. Uh, I would say that something like a Sporland OF series filter might be instrumental in that. It, you know, they claim that this thing will remove 90% of three micron size particles. 99%. Yeah, what did I say? You said 90. Well, I guess I can't read. You know, it says it right there. 98% removal of two micron size particles. Now, there's a pleated element here in this sealed model. I think it's a pretty similar pleated element that's in this removable version. Let's take some more looks at, at this little devil. This illustration shows the flow path through this sealed model oil filter. You know, the yellow arrow has the oil coming in through the center of the shell and it passes through the filter element toward the outer shell and then flows around this conical placement spring and in out. And it looks like here might be some kind of drain facility. Nice to drain have a drain mechanism. there. When yeah. you have to change it, it's very nice to be able to get, get the oil out of the filter so you don't have to deal with a big mess as you're that, changing. That's probably a flare connection with a Schrader core mm -hmm. in it, I would guess. I would bet it is. Yeah. Now we've also got a model that has a built-in spring-loaded check valve. What is that intended to do? I think it's intended to prevent a restriction in the flow in the event that filter element collects enough contaminants and debris that it would that, otherwise- That it's seriously flow. restricts yeah. flow. Mm -hmm. Now, so it opens up a check valve here at a 30 PSI differential. And if this occurs, that spring-loaded check valve opens, allows oil to bypass the filter element. You know, we've been criticized for this sometimes. It says, you're going to bypass putting the flow through that filter element. What would you say to that, John? Well, I would say that uh, by the time you have the filter element plugged up enough to create a pressure drop of 30 PSI, you're seriously cutting down on the amount of flow that you can get through there. Yeah. And uh, I think, um, though we've already talked about how compressors don't like dirty oil, um, they like no oil. <laughs> <laughs> Even less. Even less. Fair so. enough. Now, the neat thing about these sealed model oil filters, they can be installed in either a horizontal or a vertical position. And it's a good idea to have these on a preventative maintenance schedule so that you keep that from that no oil situation from ever right. occurring, especially if you don't have the bypass feature on your particular right. filter. Now, if you're doing a lot of scheduled maintenance or if you have a lot of contamination and you're, you're aware of that, the this oil filter has a replaceable filter element. It's essentially the same as the one that's in the sealed model, except you can replace just the filter element. It shows the flow path here. You got oil in, oil out. There's also, I think on the back side of this, there's actually three, there's three ports on this. And one is an access valve that allow you to depressurize this shell. And there's also a drain down here. Uh, so that's the drain feature on it. And this one, I think you're going to want to put this in a vertical position if you use. That would seem to be a good uh, idea. That'll help yeah. with any loss of system oil while you're replacing that filter element. And again, that, that routine scheduled maintenance is a good idea for these. This facilitates that. Here's another neat idea. One of our former supermarket team members, the late Steve Eschlinger, promoted this novel idea for the removal of contamination from the system oil on a temporary basis. Here you see an external line plumbed back to the compressor running through our OCV 20. That's a 20 PSI differential oil check valve. And then through the replaceable oil filter and then back out with cleaner oil back to the compressor with this circulation going on and on. 
This makes good use of those components. It can be done on a temporary basis. And there's a lot of compressors that would accommodate this mm -hmm. approach. Yep. It's a neat thing. Yep. Diagnosing oil level controls, you know, frequently caused by system problems and not necessarily a defective oil level control. So low oil level. What's a number one cause of low oil, low oil level? Um, it could have something to do with not enough oil in the system. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. How about a plugged oil filter? Certainly. Maybe a bunch of oil being transferred and tied up in an, e an equalizer lines back over to other compressors. Correct. How about high oil level? Uh, things like oil returning back through the suction line. Okay. How about oil slugs returning from traps during periods of high refrigerant velocity? Certainly. What's this, excess oil in the system reservoir? Guess that could happen. That could happen. Yeah. Oil being transferred through what? That equalizer line again. Now, keep in mind, the OL is a low level control device only. Mm -hmm. And just like John, like you said, with that, that self-contained uh, residential air conditioning system, don't forget how important good refrigerant piping techniques are and designs. Right. Uh, refrigerant velocity is a critical component to system performance and proper oil management. Over here, we got an example. You know, the complaint was the compressor is tripping on low oil level. What's a, what's a good common possible cause of that? Low oil charge. We talked about that. And then we talked about some of these other things here. That oil filter ought to be on a preventative maintenance schedule. Uh, low differential is difficult to measure uh, because it may not be flowing at the time you're going. And so that's kind of a tricky thing there. That's correct. Yeah. Let's take one last look at the high pressure oil management system. Note the use of the oil filter here and note the Y1236-C being used as a pressure regulating valve so that we don't blast these oil level controls wide open with discharge pressure. And the combination oil reservoir and separator. And then if we get this question, once we get this question multiple times through tech support, we're asked this on a semi-regular basis. It does come up and on the surface, it seems to make a lot of sense. Should oil filters remove moisture? Well, let's take a look at this and see if it truly does make sense or not. Refrigerant holds three and a half times the moisture versus POE lubricants, right? Yep. The refrigerant passes through the liquid line filter dryer at a much higher rate. This suggests five times greater than the oil is passing through the oil line components. Now, this is something that you would have more experience with this, John, than me. The dry down time is quicker in refrigerant versus oil. Mm -hmm. I guess that makes sense. If you dry the refrigerant, you'll dry the oil because moisture reaches an equilibrium with in the system. Right. So it is more effective to dry the refrigerant versus trying to dry the oil itself. Now, here's one other thing to consider. Let's say you do go ahead and install a desiccant packed filter dryer in the oil line near the compressor. And let's say it's a compacted bead dryer or even a molded core dryer, but it suffers some kind of abuse or it loses some of the desiccant material for one reason or another, that stuff's going straight into the compressor. Mm -hmm. And that might not necessarily be a good thing. Ultimately, we suggest use the a good oil filter and oil management system to capture debris and filter the oil. Use a good liquid line filter dryer, catch all, to remove moisture and dry the refrigerant. Wow, that time went by really fast. We have fun with these, don't we, John? We do. We're wrapping do. this up. Do you have any questions you can let us know? We could, we, I don't know, do you have any? We, we actually have a, a, a question or two that we might, uh, we might just answer. Do, does it have sure. something to do with this stuff or is it, it like on, it, you it know? It actually does. So we have a question. We mentioned, you know, that earlier on the low load and low velocity, the resulting low refrigerant velocity um, can contribute to oil being logged out in the system. Yes. And uh, we have a question uh, about that. And basically, is that something that is inevitable and just happens or are things put in place to remedy it? Well, the best defense you have on that is proper piping design, uh, not oversizing lines. That's probably the best defense on it. But at times, particularly uh, you know, if you're talking about a refrigeration system, a lot of times it's in the wintertime. Right. You have low load conditions. They're somewhat inevitable. Yeah. 
And so that's why you want to have a good oil control system put in, you know, put in place. Right. Uh, as well as, as we've said a number of times here, uh, good piping practices, yeah. proper, proper system piping design. You know, there's tricky things like vertical increases, uh, risers. And if you've got systems that unload, there's a technique that deploys appropriate traps and even double risers to help facilitate the proper velocities to get the lubricant back. And mm -hmm. one of these days we ought to do a refrigerant piping discussion. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other questions, John, or should we move on? Well, um, yeah, here's one uh, concerning the uh, oil filter with the bypass. Okay. The, uh, you know, as we said, the 30, 30 PSI. Triggers bypass. it. Tri right. And so there's a very good question. How do we know how to diagnose? Is it bypassing or not? And I think the answer to that one would be uh, if we know we have flow through that filter, we have to know we have flow through the filter, of right. course, to do this. But if so, uh, if you're measuring a differential across that filter uh, at or really close to 30 PSI, uh, you can assume that it is bypassing. Yeah. It's, or the, if it's not bypassing, it's about to bypass. It's about to. That's and, a good point. Uh, if you, you know, honestly, if you uh, measure in, again, having to know that you have flow through the filter, right, right. if you're measuring any kind of differential that's anywhere even in the ballpark of 30 PSI, it's time to think about changing that filter. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We'll sometimes get uh, the question, well, your, your filter, filter dryer, whatever it is, has a big pressure drop across it. Well, it's done its job. Mm -hmm. And it's time, it's time for some preventative measures then beyond that. Here we are again. Sporlin is always here to assist you with your air conditioning and refrigerant flow control needs. You can reach us by calling the general number 636-239-1111. This number will get you to tech support or even customer service if you'd like. Here's the direct dial number for tech support, 636-392-3906. You can always shoot us an email at svdtechsupport at parker.com. We're here 24 seven. You can reach us at sporlin.com. There you can access virtual engineer, our e-newsletter, chili news, virtual engineer, new product releases, events. And, and you can also get back and watch all of the webinars that we've already done. This one's being recorded. It will be out on Facebook first and then on the YouTube, YouTube channel a little later. We're doing another one of these. Defrost types, March 18th, just barely two weeks away. This concludes our webinar for today. Thanks for being here with us. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you learned a little something and please join us next time.